vagrant nation, police power, constitutional change, and the making of the 1960s. We welcome uh, Dr. Risa Golubov, uh, uh, who is the Arnold H. Leon Professor of Law and Professor of History and the Dean of the Law School at the University of Virginia. <laughs> She has brought us a deep reaching, comprehensive account of some of the constituent elements of the developments of the 1960s. I have spoken in the past about the bravery of people who yank the tops off garbage cans to reveal their inner contents. Dr. Galyubov has undertaken to examine these contents, show how they were a part of loosening the grip of the law and then how many causes were afforded opportunity to open up for the benefit of U.S. citizens. One of the things I appreciate about the Lillian Smith Book Awards is the chance to read up and learn what other scholars are thinking about contemporary historical events and the yet untold stories that are being written. Some of these we lived through. It's like an annual postdoctoral fellowship to read in-depth analysis. <laughs> First-hand accounts, coming-of-age stories, biographies, autobiographies, confessionals, as well as all manner of poetry books and novels. Perhaps one of the things we most appreciate is knowing the details of how these things came about and how much work it took for that to happen. I think one of the discussions we were having earlier was uh, not only how long it might take, but how many people had to be involved. Dr. Galyabov has written us a well thought out examination of how a long standing, purposely vague law was changed to allow some radical development to take place and transform our society. We, the jury, the Southern Regional Council, the University of Georgia, and our other constituent governing elements uh, for the, this prize are happy to award one of their, this year's prizes to Dr. Risa Galyabov for her work and urge her to continue. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Mary. And I want to echo all of the thank yous that uh, Patricia offered earlier. I am honored in receiving this award. I'm honored to share it with Patricia Bell Scott for her wonderful book. My interactions with Lillian Smith are not nearly as deep, nor are the interactions of those in my book. But I will say I have long been a fan of hers uh, as a writer, as a feminist, as a pioneer of the freedom struggle, and a social justice warrior. She is a model for many of us, certainly for me. I can't be a pioneer because those days are past, but I can continue that tradition. Uh, and I aspire to be all of those things, and she sets a very high bar. With my writing in particular, I think about how Lillian Smith changed the world and how she didn't think that it was incumbent upon someone else to change the world. She thought it was incumbent upon her. And it takes a lot of people to think that and to act on that in order for the world to change. And it's my hope that in the books that I write, I write about people who do that like Lillian Smith, not necessarily 
as effectively or as publicly, and I'll tell you about some of them in a minute. Um, but it's also my hope that revealing the history, I like the, the notion of lifting the lid off the garbage can, uh, in revealing histories that we didn't know before and in identifying people who I think are also heroes, uh, that we can be inspired to think about what the world can be even when it seems so settled in where it currently is. Uh, and then we can think about what roles that we each can play. Often when we think especially about legal history, and I'm a legal and constitutional historian as well as a social historian, we think that legal change happens somewhere else. And most of the time we think it happens in the Supreme Court and that it is effectuated by Supreme Court justices. And one of the main things that I'm here to say, something Lillian Smith knew very well, is that that's not true. I mean, they play a role, I wouldn't deny that, and a very important role, but cases don't come to them without people who bring them. And change doesn't happen until people identify the need for it. Uh, and she knew that, and, uh, and I tried to write about that in my scholarship. So my book is fundamentally about how does legal and social change happen? How is it possible that in 1952, a category of laws that has been on the books for literally 400 years, coming out of medieval and Elizabethan England to the United States when they were colonies, how is it possible that after 400 years, from 1952 to 1970, those laws become illegitimate. It's the historical blink of an eye, 20 years, and they go from being used everywhere ubiquitously, ubiquitously uh, to regulate all kinds of people to being unconstitutional and illegitimate. Uh, so I want to tell you a little bit about what vagrancy laws are because most people don't know. I'm glad to say most people don't know. Uh, and, and then tell you a little bit about some of the people who I think are the heroes of my book. So vagrancy laws that came to the colonies from England uh, and related laws like loitering and suspicious persons laws were laws that made it a crime to be a certain kind of person. Often a poor person, but not always. They made it a crime to be immoral or idle or wander about with no apparent purpose. Uh, so there were two hallmarks of vagrancy laws that made them particularly attractive to law enforcement officers. The first is that they were status offenses. So if you think of most of our laws, you do something and then you can be prosecuted for doing that thing, stealing or killing, right? Not vagrancy laws. Vagrancy laws made it a crime to be a certain kind of person. So I'm going to read you the law that eventually came to the Supreme Court in 1972. This was on the books in Jacksonville, Florida in 1972, and there were laws like them all across the country. They begin, this one begins, rogues and vagabonds or 1972, or dissolute, I know to those of you who are young in this room, that sounds like a long time ago, but it's not that long ago. Uh, persons who use juggling, or dissolute persons who go about begging, persons who use juggling or unlawful games or plays, common drunkards, common night walkers, thieves, pilferers or pickpockets, traders in stolen property, common railers and bra brawlers, persons wandering or strolling around from place to place without any unlawful purpose, any lawful purpose or object, habitual loafers, disorderly persons, shall be deemed vagrants not commit the crime of vagrancy. And I don't know about you, I live on a college campus, wandering or strolling around from place to place, <laughs> habitual loafers, right? These are things we all engage in all the time. So this sanctioned arrest by the police of virtually anyone at any time. And that's combined with the second hallmark. So the first is arresting people for who they are, not for what they do. And the second is this unbelievably broad and unlimited language. Virtually unlimited discretion to arrest anyone. You could always find a reason. And when I give you some of the examples, you'll see what I mean by that. So for centuries, officials employed these laws against anyone who is out of place in any way, and not just those you would think of as vagrants when I say that word. Vagrancy laws were used variously to regulate and extract labor from the resident poor, to exclude poor strangers from a locality and punish them, to incapacitate any threat to the social order, to prevent the commission of incipient crime, and by incipient crime I mean before a crime has been committed, to enforce racial segregation and subordination, and to discipline minorities, dissidents, and nonconformists of all stripes. These uses were ubiquitous and they were quotidian. 
But by 1972, these laws were unconstitutional. So in this 20 year period, these laws go from completely legitimate to illegitimate. And I say completely, it's a slight overstatement. There were people who before the 1950s thought they were illegitimate, illegitimate particularly those arrested under them. Uh, and, but most legal professionals, judges, lawyers, scholars, they thought they were fine, even though they were different from most other criminal laws. And not everyone after the 1970s thought they were illegitimate, especially those who deemed them necessary for public safety and who immediately began seeking replacements for them upon their unconstitutionality. But when the Supreme Court struck these laws down, they reflected a sea change in their constitutional status. They didn't create it because they were a little bit late to the party and lots of other courts had already struck them down and lots of police departments had already stopped using them and lots of legislatures were already looking for alternatives because it was clear that they were no longer compatible with basic American values. But the Supreme Court's imprimatur made that very, very clear. So the question of my book is how did that change happen? And Lillian Smith is very much alive here when I say it's because people, regular people, everyday people, acting alone, acting in groups, acting in social movements, acting with the help of lawyers, and I'll tell you about some of them as well, made that change. So let me tell you about a few of these people. There was Isidore Edelman, who was a soapbox orator in Los Angeles's Pershing Square in the late 1940s. He had communist views, though he'd been kicked out of virtually every organization he'd ever joined, including the Communist Party. <laughs> but for his communist views in Cold War America, he was arrested 63 times in quick succession. And because of those arrests, he was then arrested for vagrancy, for being a dissolute person. He'd committed crime, therefore he was lawless, dissolute, and a vagrant. There was a nine-day trial for Isidore Edelman and his vagrancy charge. And his was the first case that came up to the Supreme Court for them to start thinking about whether vagrancy laws were unconstitutional. But in 1952, they couldn't quite figure it out yet and they didn't answer the question then. And in fact, they saw more than a dozen cases between 1952 and 1972 before they finally wrapped their minds around this problem and struck it down. Another person is a man known as Shuffling Sam Thompson. Sam Thompson was a handyman and a junk peddler. He was also an alcoholic. He was an African-American man who lived in Louisville, Kentucky, and suffered constant police harassment, usually at the Louisville bus station where he had to go to get his, uh, a ride to his home on the outskirts of town. He stopped going to the Louisville bus station when his counsel suggested that he not, and he went to a black bar near a bus stop and I can't make this up, the bar was at the corner of Liberty and West Streets, at the end of Liberty Street, and it was called the Liberty End Cafe, where the cops went looking for him and arrested him for loitering for the 55th time while he shuffled his feet to the jukebox and ate some macaroni. There was, and this is probably the only person uh, any of you have heard of on my list, the Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, who was described, quote, as a notorious person in the field of civil rights in Birmingham in his Supreme Court case on this issue. He was a co-founder with Martin Luther King Jr. of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And he was arrested for loitering, for refusing to vacate a street corner on which he was talking with a few colleagues during a boycott of downtown department stores in his hometown of Birmingham in the spring of 1962. He paused between 12 seconds and a minute or two for that conversation. There's also Joy Kelly, a young white hippie in Charlotte, North Carolina, who rented a house as a crash pad for her hippie friends. They suffered police harassment all hours of the day and night, and finally the police arrested 18 people who were in the house for vagrancy, including Joy herself, while in the house for which she had to a lease. And she was told that if she ever returned to the house, she would be arrested again. There's Stephen Wainwright, a Tulane law student who was unlucky enough to resemble a murder suspect when he went out for a bite to eat in the French Quarter. The murder suspect was white and young like him and had a tattoo on his arm that said, born to raise hell. The police asked him to bear his arm on the street and he refused, in part as a law student, he knew his rights or so he thought. He was a little belligerent about them perhaps. Uh, he raised hell. Uh, but also, he, he didn't want to bear his arm and when he refused, though they were looking for a murderer, they arrested him for vagrancy. And then there's Martin Hershorn, who had dressed as a woman since he was 17 years old. He was a hairstylist in Manhattan, and the police found him in the hotel room in which he lived, wearing only a half slip and a brassiere, and arrested him under an old New York state law that made anyone masquerading in public 
so as to conceal their identity a vagrant. Leave aside that he was not in public. Leave aside, as his lawyers argued in one of the first uh, gender identity cases on record, that he was actually expressing his identity rather than concealing it by dressing in what he viewed as his true gender. These folks are obscure, they are not famous, they are unconnected, and they are very different from one another. They're white and black, they're men and women, they're arrested in public and private for political protests and for seeming like a murderer. They're arrested for their sexuality, their gender identity, their poverty, or their long hair. The constitutional claims that they made in the cases that followed were also very different from one another. They were about free speech and association about the rights of criminal defendants, about cruel and unusual punishment and involuntary servitude, about race and poverty discrimination, privacy and other fundamental rights. Their differences show the kaleidoscope that was vagrancy regulation, its ubiquity and its flexibility, its use as an ever-present police tool to keep people in their imagined places. There's no coincidence, and you might already have been thinking about this in the subtitle of my book that Mary mentioned, that they represented most of the progressive social movements of the 1960s. African Americans and other civil rights activists, communists, labor union members, poor people, beats, hippies, gay men, lesbians, and other sexual minorities, women, Vietnam War protesters, student activists, young urban minority men, and other dissidents. Folks who had been regulated by vagrancy laws were now organized, they were assertive, and they had lawyers. And what they realized was that vagrancy laws were obstacles to their other goals, whether their goals were about sexual freedom, racial equality, or political protest. So this is not a coincidence. If you cannot walk down the street as yourself in order to attain the other goals for which you strive, then those other goals are pretty hard to vindicate. Another way of putting this is the growing realization at this time that police officers and executive officials, as much as legislatures and laws, hindered the social movements of the 1960s and equally required intervention. Of course, the lived experience of the law, I was thinking about this as you were talking about the Lillian Smith, Polly Murray uh, interaction about, don't go to that legal jargon, right? Speak your, well, the legal jargon's the way the lawyers do it, right? And in fact, it amplifies the voices of these regular people. So my book, as much as my book is about uh, the individuals who put social change into motion, it is also about the lawyers who heard them and who took their cases and who understood that the law was changing and this had to be a part of that change. When I first started uh, writing my book, I, uh, I, was, I was miffed because I couldn't find the single lawyer or the single organization who propelled this as a legal reform movement. And I had in mind, as I'm sure many of you do, Brown versus Board of Education and the NAACP and Thurgood Marshall and a vision and a prosecution of that vision on the road to Brown. And my first book, I actually wrote about how that's oversimplified and there wasn't one road and there were many paths and choices were made about those paths. But there was still a core uh, idea uh, that, uh, that the NAACP led there. And I never found that here. What I found here instead were lawyers, some uh, affiliated with the NAACP, some affiliated with the ACLU, some with other organizations, some on their own, all over the country, coming up against this problem, realizing that it was a problem, and trying to write litigation, bring litigation, and write briefs, and advocate for their clients about it. And at first I thought, it can't be as important if there wasn't a legal reform movement that looked like Brown. And then I realized that there are ways in which, I wouldn't say more important, but how valuable this was. This problem became so apparent to so many different people because of all of the social movements that were happening at the time. And it's actually quite empowering in a Lillian Smith kind of way to say each of us has this power and every lawyer has this power and we each have the power to put this in motion because we can reach out to any lawyer. And it's not only Thurgood Marshall and it's not only the NAACP Legal Defense Fund that is able to make change. Uh, so I, I'll mention just a couple of the lawyers. I want to finish. Uh, I don't want to go on too long. Um, but as a teacher of lawyers and now as the leader of an institution that produces lawyers, um, I can't help but say the lawyers are a key part of the story. They do put it in legal jargon. They make the lived experience of the law and the oppressions of the law cognizable to other lawyers and legal professionals, to legislators, and to judges. 
uh, and they uh, bring people into the formal mechanisms of the law and enable that change to happen. So these were people like A.L. Weirin and Fred Okrand, who represented Isidore Edelman, our soapbox orator. They were affiliated with the Southern California ACLU. As early as the 1930s, Al Weirin was representing farm workers who were arrested for vagrancy when they tried to organize against California growers. Think Grapes of Wrath. As late as 1983, Fred Okrand was involved in a United States Supreme Court decision striking down a California loitering law that replaced its older, more traditional vagrancy law that was used against an African-American man who frequently walked around white neighborhoods and was arrested for being out of place. So between them, Al Weirin and Fred Okren spanned 50 years of vagrancy legislation and litigation. Or meet Ernest Bessick, who was the head of the Northern California ACLU. He and uh, his southern uh, counterparts had lots of fights about where north ended and south began. Uh, and where they, where Weirin and Okren faced different kinds of vagrancy defendants at different times, Bessig in the 1950s was simultaneously fielding complaints from the Beats, from African Americans, and from gay men and lesbians. And he was one of the people who first recognized wow, this law, it's used for everything, right? And started to think systematically about it. Uh, and he had all these file folders, which was what helped me think systematically about it and ask the question, who did come under this law? How was it used? And how did people start to organize against it? And the last person I'll mention is Anthony Amsterdam who published a paper on why vague laws like vagrancy laws were unconstitutional while he was still a law student. It is still one of the most cited law review articles ever published today. I tell this to my law students all the time. Uh, he says he wrote it in two weeks at the end of his third year of law school, which I believe. Uh, and it's quite remarkable. But immediately upon graduation, uh, uh, Jack Greenberg reached out to him and said, hey, I, I think your article can help us with all of these uh, sit-in demonstrators and protesters that we're defending against these vague laws. And Anthony Amsterdam became a kind of adjunct to the NAACP uh, Legal Defense Fund, although he was also uh, a law professor for his life. And he brought his vagrancy expertise to bear in the civil rights struggle for Vietnam War protesters uh, and in uh, criminal procedure cases. So he also was one of the real sinews that linked uh, all of the various defendants uh, together. So what the book does at the the end of the day is construct a history of vagrancy laws and their downfall and then uses that history as a lens into the history of the 1960s and all of the different people and movements that made the changes that we all associate with the 1960s happen. And in telling those stories, I move from the people who experienced the law to the people who advocated for them to the judges who decided the cases uh, and back again. Uh, and I ultimately show, I hope, this is my goal, that the vagrancy laws were a key part of the maintenance of the establishment that existed and that their fall was a key part of changing what that looked like and enabling people to choose their own places rather than be put in places by that establishment. So the pivotal moment comes in 1972 with that uh, uh, ordinance that I read to you before in a case called Papa Christi v. City of Jacksonville. And there were eight different defendants in that case, but I want to talk about four of them. Two were white women and two were African American men. And they were out on the town in 1969 together in a car in Jacksonville. And they got pulled over and they were charged, and on the arrest sheet, it says that they were charged with vagrancy for prowling by auto. Now, had that been in the ordinance, I would have read it to you. It was not in the ordinance, but no one cared because that was the nature of vagrancy laws. And in fact, someone called Margaret Papacristou's parents from the police station and said, did you know that your daughter was out with a Negro tonight? So it was clear why they were pulled over. And in 1969, two years after Loving versus Virginia, it was clear that anti-miscegenation laws were unconstitutional and the police were using vagrancy laws as a stand-in to do the kind of racial regulation that they couldn't do directly. Justice William O. Douglas wrote the opinion uh, he had long fancied himself a kind of vagrant himself. He tells stories that may or may not be apocryphal in his various memoirs about riding the rails with the hobos and the industrial workers of the world, about singing Woody Guthrie songs and hallelujah, I'm a bum. He did have uh, vagrancy folders in his file, and I can attest, this is not apocryphal, that he was an honorary member of the Hobos of America, which named him a knight of the open road and whose correspondence he meticulously kept. His opinion reads as something of an anthem 
for the 1960s. He had been watching vagrancy laws and the challenges to them for 20 or 30 years. Uh, and when this moment comes, he makes the most of it. And after almost 40 years as Supreme Court Justice, this was the opinion that he wanted read at his funeral. And to me, that really encapsulates how much vagrancy was about this shift that happens in the 1960s. At the end of the book, I address in broad strokes what has changed and not changed since then. And I won't go into that here. But I will say, I've been thinking a lot about it lately, and I've talked to a number of you about it today. Uh, and that's especially because I am the dean of the law school at the University of Virginia, and my home is Charlottesville. Uh, and I imagine you all know what I mean when I say that, and my son is here with me today, and he certainly knows as well. When you watch groups of people spewing hate and intolerance identify themselves as the new free speakers, and seek police protection. It really turns the way I think about my book and the relationship between police and protesters on their head. Uh, and it has been shocking and jarring to think about how my book applies uh, in this day and age. And I'm still working to assimilate it with what I already know. And I vacillate between, at a, at a high level of generality, two things. Thinking, one, that this moment these people, this event, and the events like them, like it, that have been happening across the country, are a late and ultimately futile protest to a society that has undergone fundamental change for the last 60 years in fits and starts and incompletely, to be sure, to create the equality that Lillian Smith dreamt of. But on the other hand, I worry, this is number two, that this is not the case and that we are seeing the beginning of a new movement that might gain strength to undermine what we have already accomplished and what she and millions of others have been fighting for. And either way, it's my hope that Vagrant Nation in the tradition of Lillian Smith and the work of Lillian Smith, Eleanor Roosevelt, Pauli Murray, Patricia Bell Scott, and all those I've mentioned today, plus so many more, teaches us that each of us has a role to play in making the future we want to see, in shaping the law, in creating equality, and in treating each other with the full humanity that we all deserve. And I, for one, stand ready to do just that. And I know that many of you, with Lillian Smith fresh in our minds, will stand ready as well. Thank you.